book starts, the, the prologue of the book is essentially a profile of, uh, I'm sure you know this figure, Madan Mohan Malviya. And the role that he played in germinating a certain kind of political thinking on the role of uh, what, you know, of a role of technology as Maya said in nation building. And the argument of the prologue is that Madan Mohan Malviya is, Narendra Modi is the intellectual successor, the political successor of Madan Mohan Malviya. But the objective of bringing him out uh, from you know, dusting off the cobwebs of history into a book on technology is to show that we were influenced by a group of people, technocrats, some of them were technocrats, some of them were you know, high profile members of the political class, were skeptical of technology, uh, not least the room Mahatma Gandhi, who used to be deeply skeptical of big machines and big technology. And we had this pantheon of leaders and technocrats who influenced their perceptions towards nation. Now we can say one person influenced uh, nation building as it relates to technology more than the others and that invariably has to be Nehru given the position of power and authority that he held for uh, nearly two decades. But the fact is that there was no uniform view towards how India should develop technologically right from the, the you know, even before independence. Uh, for example, uh, the precursor to the planning commission the Niti Aayog was the National Planning Committee that Pandit Nehru eventually chaired. Less known is the fact that Moksha Bhutan Vishweshwaraya, who is a, who was an engineer based out of Mysore, chief engineer of Mysore, and who was, who was uh, given the Bharat Ratna in the 50s, was also a member of the National Planning Committee. Vishweshwaraya and Nehru believed in two very different approaches to nation building. Vishweshwaraya and Madan Mohan Malaviya believed that you should imitate first, not innovate. Whatever cheap technologies were available, and they were in awe of countries like Meiji Japan and even Nazi Germany. Of course, they realized the problems associated, the political problems associated with these uh, uh, countries. But these were the figures in independent, in, in pre-independent, post-independent India who believed that technology just had to be absorbed and bought as is from, from countries more advanced than us. Nehru different. Nehru believed in the creation of what is now famously the scientific temper. He wanted to cultivate uh, Indians towards a certain view of technology, you know, kindle their inquisition, their temper, and thereby create Indian technology for India. And I think, perhaps the book is a little hard, but I believe that he failed in his endeavor. He created these temples of modern India, the Indian Institutes of Technology and Science and so on and so forth. Most of the scientific research institutions that continue to exist even today. But the fact is that he could not link the scientific talent that had been built up in India. And many people left their PhDs in England and the United States at that time to come and work with a newly independent, newly liberated society. But unfortunately, many of them started going back because the idea of nation building that was sparked by Nehru at that time could just not meet the demands of the market. So that's where we begin, and I hope that's perhaps at least a, a cue for the rest of the conversation. Um, Okay, that's where we begin. I want to, uh, before I uh, get Shashi to respond on your views on how uh, Jawaharlal Nehru handled India's technological journey, uh, Professor Vijayaratan, if I can get you in on this, I mean, uh, Arun is making the point that um, the attention was on creating a scientific temper in the Indian population post-independence and, um, you know, his idea and notions of, welcome. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, of a scientific temper often meant that uh, maybe the day-to-day, -day, the innovation, not imitation, uh, has impacted our journey along the way. Can you tell us what your views on this are and, and in general your comments about the book? Let me just uh, make sure I screw this right before I put it down. That was a technological comment. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya. I think you need to put the microphone on. Is it, is it on? Yeah, it's on. Yeah. yeah. Good. So, um, thank you very much, Maya, and it's very really good to be on this panel with uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor and uh, Arun and now Amitabh Kant. Um, I had a chance to actually read the book at uh, high speed over the last couple of days. And I was also fortunate to get a digital copy so I could search and find specific components. Uh, and I must congratulate Arun. This is a fantastic book. It does, uh, you know, valuable primary source search and research on uh, a wide range of uh, work in India. So that's the part which I admire a lot. 
I have, you know, uh, challenges of interpretation, and those are perfectly fine. You know, he has a viewpoint which he's articulated very really well. Uh, my concern is the following: that from that data, to make a leap about civilizational issues, about this is the way Nehru thought, and this is the way Bhatnagar thought, and so on and so forth, is to, in today's world, summarize very complex situations in rather tight ways. For every instance you have of Vishweshwara being an imitator and not an emulator, you find his groundbreaking work in Karnataka extraordinary. It was not just, you know, buying, you know, technologies for, uh, for, uh, for using for hydroelectric use and so on, but those implementations were fantastic. The institutional building in Mysore then was absolutely stunning. Similarly with Shantaswara but not, uh, you know, in terms of what the initial research was. Conversely, with Baba and Sarabha, for every innovative work they did, which, you know, was not just importing, you would find examples of international collaboration which addressed, you know, uh, the best minds <coughs> elsewhere and got them to come and teach at the Tata Extra Fundamental Research and so on. So the space, there is room for these two different kinds of ideas of imitation and emulation, but I think there's a much finer granularity of these different viewpoints within individuals, within institutions, and uh, it's a lot more complex than that uh, state. There are lots more, but as we go on, we'll discuss. Right, Shashi, I'd like you to come in on, on this as well because a couple of the things that come to light in this book and through uh, our own telling of the India's technological story, uh, you know, during the Jawaharlal Nehru year, uh, years as well as then in the years of the emergency is essentially, uh, to me, either a story of failure, as he points out, or lost opportunities. And are those because there was a hesitation to embrace technology? Technology is something while we all aspire to be able to use, it also instills a sense of fear because there are, you know, there are the, uh, there's, there's the unknown as far as technology is concerned as well. And do you think that at a time when nation building was a priority, this fear of the unknown kind of also played into both the political psyche, the public psyche, and therefore we aren't really where we should have been? There's no denying that Simon's thesis. I mean, he sees the story as a story of missed opportunity. And while I share many of Alan's biases and predilections, including his, his uh, greater faith in the private sector uh, as an engine of technology, for example, uh, I would say that it's fair to point out, as Dr. Vidya also did, that at some points uh, the thesis is slightly overstated and that it doesn't always take into account extenuating factors. I say this with a lot of affection for him because I think he's actually a terrific writer. He's got a, a journalist side for detail, he's got a historian's talent for serious research, and he's got at the same time a novelist here for narrative because the pace really flows so beautifully. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fun read. And everything about this book is one that I want to encourage you all to read, even though it's not always kind about some people I wouldn't be kind of too. But that's because I was working on a PhD, and the PhD you have to relentlessly toil away on proving your hypothesis. So you tell your advisor, this is my hypothesis, and I'm going to spend the next 400 pages demonstrating it. So obviously everything else that might slightly dilute your approach goes, and that habits are spread over into this book as well. So for example, with Nehru, as, as Dr. Vidya Ravan also said, first of all, I think Ravan doesn't give Nehru enough credit for the laying of the basic platform of scientific uh, and technological excellence that gave us, not just the IITs, but the entire culture of technological uh, studies that eventually made the Y2K revolution possible. I mean, we forget, for example, when Arun says that Nehru's fault was he kept it confined to elites. And I, I'm not disagreeing with his analysis that Gandhi's resistance to technology made Nehru and others in the Congress uh, a little ambivalent uh, about how much, how gung they could afford to be. And therefore, Arun seems to suggest the broad public remained unconvinced about technology. The government didn't do enough to evangelize them, and a few elite uh, technological islands were formed. And I, I think that overstates it. First of all, if, if, if there wasn't enough evangelization, you wouldn't have whatever it is, a 12 lakh kids taking 
the IIT and into terms for a jury to lay out, you know, wherever else. And it, the, 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 the desire to excel in the technological domain is widespread and is deeply entrenched. And I do give Nehru the credit for starting that particular ball rolling. The scientific temper language of the directive principles of the Constitution was very much Nehru's contribution. He became the first Prime Minister to attend the Indian Science Congress and did so every single year that he was Prime Minister. If it was kind of a token thing, he would not have bothered to go year after year after year and find creative and sensible things to say and encourage uh, the scientific community. Where I would agree with that is that there was a lot of bureaucratization of decision making. Policy choices were made by an all-knowing, all-seeing government that decided that they would judge what the Indian people really needed. Uh, we did not let a thousand flowers bloom uh, technologically. And, 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 and certainly, therefore, there is enough to sustain the argument that we could have done some things better. I would only, however, ask Alan to look at the times, look at the, the global uh, uh, mood about these matters, about state intervention, about the challenges of development. Remember that Nehru was the first of the various developing country prime ministers to actually have a country to run free of the colonial yoke and have to learn a lot of these things from scratch. I think you've allowed yourself to forget that. I think you've also allowed yourself to forget how much better India did despite being the first than many, many other developing countries which coming later made worse mistakes in the same direction whether on development, whether on state control, whether on state capitalism, whether on technology. Uh, and India, thanks in part to Nehru and the decision makers after him, laid enough groundwork for the kind of changes that became possible later. And as Arun himself acknowledged, Y2K is what really was the big breakthrough, right? Because the entire world, in 1998, we had been sanctioned by the Western countries for the poker and blast. Then in 1999, they were afraid that all their computers were going to crash. Uh, when the um, you know, midnight moment struck and, and the, the two-digit date no longer made sense as these two turned the millennium. There was this whole bunch of Indian software programmers created by the scientific establishment that was unleashed on the world and that actually helped win us uh, the much more benign image of Indian technology that now really prevails around the world. So I would say that there is enough material within Arun's book, and that's a comprehensiveness of his research, to slightly contradict uh, the extent of his emphasis. But having said that, it's still a great book, and I commend it to all of you. Um, before, before we move on, I'm going to let you do... Just, you know, it's interesting that Shashi mentioned the Y2K example because you talk about it in the book and you talk about how, you know, Chandra Bunaid, who, who was uh, the, uh, the Chief Minister of Andhra Pradesh at the time, when uh, we saw this great IT boom taking place in Andhra Pradesh, was essentially booted out because Y2K happened and the IT programmers entered Hyderabad and the rest of the, the state essentially fell by the wayside. So once again, this tussle between technology and, I don't know, people and what happens to people in the face of technology. Perhaps, I mean, in your defense, uh, uh, you know, what uh, uh, my response to Shashi would be, I think what he's trying to say is that you need to carry along both together and not separate one from the other. No, I agree with that. Uh, I just felt that he, he sort of... Overemphasized. This one, 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 <laughs> one went to the left. Oh, wow. yeah, so, so uh, if you can, you know, because you also make the point of these you know, uh, in the context of bureaucratization or decision making or state intervention, you also make the point that the West kind of loosened the reins on technology and you said the East cannibalized it. I mean, that was, uh, Eastern governments cannibalized it. So just, just walk us through a little bit of what you mean by this. So, and to sort of pick off from the point perhaps I have been harsh in my case work announcements, on some of the aspects relating to the narrow years in particular. One aspect that, which I mentioned, which is something truly out of India's control, is the availability of sensitive technologies. <coughs> and it is to Nehru's credit that he was able to deliver through his skillful diplomacy, which I think is the, you know, the, 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 perhaps the legacy that will be most indelible uh, out of all the things that we, you know, attribute Nehru to, uh, attribute to Nehru uh, today. And the success of his public policy was that he was able to bring in an America, a Soviet Union, a France, a Germany, countries that perhaps opposed each other in the international stage, but managed to come together for the building of some technologies in India. For example, I may be getting this wrong, but the first uh, 
a rocket that was launched off Tumba in Tiruvannathapuram in uh, off the coast of uh, Trivandrum had, I believe, uh, Soviet helicopters uh, monitoring the launch, a French Apache rocket um, that was installed with the help of American engineers and uh, you know, I think there was another country involved in as well. This is effectively the, you know, the culmination of the normal life movement. Here were you know, people from all parts of the world sharing some, in some domains, very sensitive technologies with India and that's supposed to uh, show how forceful and effective Nehru was with diplomacy. So the fact is that we weren't able to capitalize on the gains that had come. Now, for example, most of the steel plants that we set up in Lokano, Road, Kinnar, etc. They are different countries collaborated with India to provide the know-how and, uh, and, and in the, the actual setting up of these uh, iron and steel plants. Uh, same uh, goes for the, the, temp the temples of modern India, the dams as well, as well as the IIT. So it, it goes to Nehru's credit that he was able to secure international collaboration. But again, the, the criticism still remains. He was unable to forge this link between uh, industry and the laboratory and industry. And the book sort of highlights the case of the solar cooker, which was the first prototype, the indigenous solar cooker was uh, created in 1952 at the Times of India uh, that year carried a front page headline saying the Prime Minister had boiled cabbages for uh, dinner using the solar cooker. Well, there was absolutely, this is probably one of the first instances of fake news also. There was no, there was no recorded instance of the solar cooker working, even the scientists at the Council of uh, scientific and industrial research admitted that the only thing that this could be used for was to heat coffee to a lukewarm uh, level. So the, you know, the fact is that Nehru invested serious political capital in projects that were doomed to fail because again solar technology was not developed at that time. Yet perhaps due to naivety, idealism, uh, naive, uh, idealism or his enthusiasm to see Indian technology take off uh, there is a funny story, Egypt wanted a prototype of the solar cooker and we gave them uh, a prototype free of cost. The joke was that they never asked for another copy of another <laughs> working model of the solar cooker again. So, the fact is that there were many failures. Perhaps my overemphasis in the failures at that point of time uh, comes from an attempt uh, to highlight that, you know, we talk about the scientific temper, but we also understand, we ha also have to understand what the failures of technology were at that point of time. Dr. Tharoor, for instance, mentioned the IITs. How many people remain in India after graduating from the IITs? Brain drain was a problem even never uh, identified. You know, GM Mehta was his uh, ambassador to the United States at that time, and GM Mehta would get uh, letters by a very frustrated Nehru saying, you know, parents and kids always want to tell me that uh, they want to come back to India from the United States, but they don't have the right technology. So Nehru shot off a letter to J.M. Mehta once saying, tell them to go to Mexico. So this is the kind of frustration that was evidenced right from 1950s to now. And I think some blame has to fall on the leadership of that era in failing to create this link between uh, industry and Laboratory. All right, thank you. We haven't had Mantra yet, but just one second. On the solar cooker, you are implying that had the solar cooker been left to the private sector, it would have worked. My argument is that given market realities and indeed the immaturity of the technology, left to the private sector, they would never have developed a massive solar cooker. So they wouldn't even have been a boy carriage. So I mean, the fact that the private sector operates with a different logic. The government was prepared to back a completely untested technology with taxpayers' money because it wasn't governed by profits and loss. So, I mean, you can, you can argue you know, back and forth, but I, I, I share much of your biases in favor of the private sector in a lot of these areas. But the counterfactuals of history are always suspect. And what might have been, you know, I, I honestly think if we never just said to the private sector, challenge you to build a solar cooker, they'd have tried to say the technology isn't there, it's too expensive, it can't work, we can't make it viable, we can't mass produce it. Forget it. And that would have been that. At least the government tried and built a virgin part we could foist something Egyptian. <laughs> so, I, I guess that's a fair point. I don't know, I mean, we can debate that after the panel discussion is over. But Amitabh Khan, let me bring you in on this as well. Because Arun has made uh, some very interesting points about, you know, as, as we're discussing right now, the failures of previous political dispensations uh, to embrace, advance, technology and it's not just as he said not just you know space and nuclear but day, everyday technologies as well this book is for all of us it's not for hardcore scientists it's for a lay person to understand uh, where we are 
he's illuminated and illustrated failures of past governments. One could argue that the current dispensation is in a sense also repeating some of the mistakes of the past. Uh, we have this great push towards um, digital advancement with digital India, make in India, skilling India, things like that, our smart cities programs. Uh, but really where are we on these kinds of projects? Have we learned from the lessons of the past? I read it overnight a couple of days back and uh, you know, it's, it's almost uh, reads like a thriller in many ways, and uh, I think this is the first book of its kind which uh, lays down the political philosophy behind the technological evolution of India. Uh, having said that, many, uh, many areas, many areas of the book on which I personally don't agree with Arun at all. Uh, one of which is, of course, that you know Nehru laid the foundations of uh, um, very many things in India. I mean, look at the Bhakra and the, the dam, the IITs and so on. But I later became, you know, just before this posting of mine, I became uh, Secretary DIPP. And uh, I could see the remnants of uh, the Director General of uh, Technological Development. And there, you know, every single technology proposal uh, used to be approved by section officers and undersecretaries setting, you know, the old power. And imagine what they must, I mean, I sometimes shudder to think of what they must have gone through because today, 98.9% of the foreign direct investment which comes into India comes through the automatic route. Uh, almost just about everything other than defense and parts of insurance is all uh, allowed to come in as FDI. 99% of it coming through automatic route. Imagine what entrepreneurs and particularly young entrepreneurs uh, would have gone through pushing their approvals, uh, getting licenses, pushing their files to section officers, etc. So, you know, the great thing was that Nehru laid the foundations of many great infrastructure projects, laid the foundations of the IITs, but he killed the private sector initiative in India. And I think, to my mind, if you look at the history of Japan, if you look at Korea, even if you look at China in recent times, and if you read this great, really fascinating book by Bakwal, uh, Kai Fu Li, who's written about AI superpowers, on how the copycats of China have really become the original poster boys of artificial intelligence now. So, what it truly brings out is that in the long run, if you want to drive a nation to high levels of growth of 9 to 10 percent, and if you want technology to be the key driver, is the private sector which has to be the key driver of growth. And the absorption of technology really happens through the private sector. And therefore, to my mind, one of, the, one of the great things that's happening today, first and foremost, I think, uh, what, what the present government seems to be doing, and I, I would just like to speak from my own experience, you know, uh, this big push towards what we are doing through the Artel Innovation Mission is really to radically restructure the Indian education system and make it more innovative. We were close to about 4,500 tinkering labs and schools. That is, you're providing robots, 3D printers, internet of things from class 5 onwards. And imagine what is going to happen, you know, in the next two or three years, you're going to cut across India and open in about 25,000 schools. And suddenly we find that students from IIT and students from public school and students from slum schools competing on great challenges which India is confronted with. And we ran this competition and we found that the students from slum areas were far more competitive were far more innovative and far more disruptors than students from IIT and from public public schools. So you, we should have disrupted the Indian education system from this Anglo-Saxon system of education, of having of studying books, getting into the next class and getting into the next class. So I think that was long called for, which we didn't do for years, for decades and decades. Secondly, I think what has really truly been done now is to unleash the innovative and the technological spirit of India through the startup India movement. And what we are seeing today is 30,000 startups disrupting India in a manner which the world has never seen before. I mean, these are Indians. I mean, Silicon Valley may be the most innovative place in the world, but they have no challenges. I mean, they do things like driverless cars. But in India, all the challenges of the world are here. So finding a solution to drinking water, finding a solution to providing seed and fertilizer to the farmer depending on soil and weather conditions 
of enabling health, improving health outcomes and learning outcomes. Or look at a young girl, uh, Aditi, who runs in Bible, Rajasthan, attacking every single student on education, on health, on learnings, uh, across history, maths, physics, and tracking them through machine learning and artificial intelligence. And these are young entrepreneurs who are doing it. So I'm extremely optimistic about what is happening in India today. We are seeing technology, machine learning, data, all being absorbed in a manner which the, in, which the world truly really has never seen before. I mean, no country in the world has 1,200, 1200 million Indians with mobiles. No country in the world has 1,200 million with biometrics. I mean, something which the previous government had started, but uh, the present Prime Minister uh, just absorbed that, just took it upon himself to drive that, and 1,200 million with mobile bank account. So what is it? You know, I mean, I was working in the fisheries sector of Kerala. Uh, the challenge there was to improve the learnings of traditional, to improve the learnings of traditional fishermen. They used to just get about 18% of the market price of uh, fish catch. We were able to provide uh, fishing nets, new craft, new output motors. But opening that bank account was a nightmare. It used to take me six months, seven months to open a bank account. Today you can walk into a bank, use your biometric, open a bank account in less than a minute. So what India is really going to throw up is massive amount of data. And India has become data rich before it has become rich. And therefore all these young entrepreneurs, we have about a thousand young startups working on artificial intelligence. What they are going to use is this massive data and use it for machine learning and artificial intelligence. That's really laying the foundations of finding solutions to the whole challenges of the world. I mean, India is the only country which will use this data to really find solutions to the world. And therefore, this is to my mind path breaking what India has done. I just have a follow-up question before I bring in the uh, other panelists on this. Understandably, Startup India has got all these people, all these uh, companies who are working and innovating in education and water management and all kinds of things. Uh, but aren't you painting a slightly exaggerated rosy picture of where we are today? Because while there might be data, while there might be uh, technological advancement the way you're saying it, we're still an economy that's, you know, got high unemployment, 45 year high unemployment, a 40 year low in consumer spending. Uh, these are realities as well. So is it something that the government is finding hard to manage because the, the fear of technology coming and taking away jobs, maybe it's happening already. Uh, the challenges for any government to manage uh, that transition is not an easy one. How do you do it? Uh, so, you know, all the solutions to the problems of India cannot be found by the government. I mean, if you put in the owners the government to find all the solutions, it's not possible. I mean, you need community participation, you need a general underwear, you need young Indians to find solutions to problems of India. And therefore, the important thing is that pass on the huge technological power, unleash this technological power of India through the private enterprise. Uh, that is really, to my mind, the key. And if you have a thousand entrepreneurs working with data and machine learning, you are definitely going to improve learning and health outcome. I work on a program where I work on 115 backward districts of India. We don't call them the backward districts, we call them the, the Prime Minister calls them the aspirational districts of India. We track data on 49 indicators on a real-time basis, real-time basis from the field on these indicators. We challenge these districts every minute when they are competing. We name and shame that the best performing districts we perform. One year, we've seen radical transformation simply because of the use of data and machine learning. And therefore, we, you know, ten of these districts we are working with ISRO data. We are working with ISRO data. Another startup called Satcho to enhance agriculture productivity or see through through just real time data. We see massive transformation in both Chhattisgarh and Chhattisgarh. So this is what is going to happen once you unleash technology and pass it on to the private enterprise. Professor Vijay, I'm going to like you also to come in on this point that I've asked Amitabh uh, Khan to comment on, which is you know, the, the challenge or the conflict uh, between technology and technological advancement and job creation. Chris, that by linking education and science to technology. You cannot have talking about technology alone 
without primary school education, high school education, college education of quality. Now, as was mentioned earlier, India is unusual amongst post-colonial countries in investing in science and technology the way it did. And you can see the consequences of that in everything we do today. Uh, it's not just ISRO and the defense and the atomic energy, but our vaccine programs, for example, have had enormous reach. And although Arun uh, mentions in his book about the Indo-US vaccine action program and its challenges, that program has actually been tra has been transformed. Today, Indian industry, because of the Indo-US vaccine action program, not in spite of it, two out of three vaccines in the world today are made by Indian companies. The Rotavac vaccine, which is an indigenous vaccine, developed here in partnership with the Indo-US vaccine program, provide, provides rotavirus, antirotavirus uh, vaccine uh, at cheap cost and has been introduced to the immunization program. So there are many things which have happened because of this investment in education and science and there's much to be proud of. Uh, for example, Arun mentioned that most students from IITs go abroad. That's slightly fraction, uh, factually incorrect. A very large number of students from all sorts of engineering backgrounds go abroad and India's young demography still leaves behind the bulk of people behind here and they do extraordinarily well. All of ISRO, right, has literally a handful of undergraduates from IITs over there. They've done extraordinarily well. So our training, our education programs are really very good. There's much to be proud of in our laboratories, in our research laboratories, in CSR and the other laboratories. The challenge is not that there's something to be dismissive about that. Arun mentions the solar cooker, but for every solar cooker fiasco of that kind he mentions, there are hundreds of things which CSI laboratories have also done under very difficult days. And today, their challenge is can you liberate them to partner with industry? Can you liberate industry to partner with our research institutions much more? Our research institutions with, you know, uh, with, with academia much more? That is happening extraordinarily well for an interesting combination of reasons. One principal reason is the resurgence of ambition. At independence, we had a shared sense of purpose and ambition. Over time, for a variety of reasons, this extraordinary trust in government to do everything changed to industry making discordant demands with government, civil society making discordant demands, and these three legs going in their own directions. And that was not good. That resulted in a gridlock in the way we needed to go ahead. It wasn't any ideological uh, reason. It was because, you know, we didn't have a shared sense of purpose and we didn't have an ambition. Both of those are coming back and I think extraordinary things are happening. Technologically, India will recover rapidly now for an interesting reason is that unlike steel mills being the dominant technology of 1940s and 50s, today's technology development and innovation lies here. It's in design. The chip which Qualcomm had a war on with China and USA was over IP. The design engineers who designed that chip are in Hyderabad. They work for Qualcomm. 70% of design engineers in all these top companies are of Indian origin. Right? Our challenge is to liberate our industry academia partnership so that these design engineers can work here. Qualcomm, by the way, is the largest chip company that's got no manufacturing whatsoever. It has, it farms out its manufacturing to multiple companies. So having missed various kinds of, you know, metaphorical buses, the semiconductor bus or the biotech bus and so on, today everything is dominated by design. Indians have, for a variety of reasons, an extraordinary leverage over there that we need to push. We need to also learn to work together. We need to stop being self-deprecating constantly. We need to link India with Bharat. The reason why our policy mandates were so stuck for so long is that there's no skin off my back if a vaccine is delayed by 10 years because I can buy my vaccines. The rest of the country is in a problem and I don't care for them. And that's a bad attitude and that's the attitude of the elite. That breakdown between those who sit on committees and those who actually reserve, uh, who receive the consequences of committees is absolutely necessary. Amitabh's work in the aspirational districts without a single increase in budget made this link happen by demanding of the people who deliver services accountability. And just that, a 
diagnostics lab. So we may demand accountability, a connect to our citizens by our elite institutions, a connect to our industry from academia and facilitate that and push that. Then, because of our interesting technological cusp which is happening, we can not only catch up but do really well. After you do that, uh, I'd like to get into something which perhaps will be somewhat controversial for uh, for many when they read your book, uh, which is, I mean, as you started with Madan Mohan Malviya and his whole push towards uh, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, you linked it to uh, it also being intrinsic to faith and faith and technology and um, not just nationalist politics. I mean, if I can uh, find the quote that I had taken up, but I think it's Essentially, uh, you know what I'm referring to when you when you made that um, analogy. And again, in that context, you point out that in the history of uh, independent India now, after Madan Mohan Mahadeva, it is only Prime Minister Modi that actually has that same kind of vision that links faith, progress, and technological advancement together. Can you explain that? The reason why I think Madan Mohan Mahadeva was a Vishwasaraya I would say it's kind of was cut off the same cloth uh, as Malve himself is this linking that Malve mentioned between faith and technology. Malve used to say that you should work in your engineering schools in the morning and then come retreat to the to the classes of culture and religion in the evening. And this sort of really set him apart from the other technocrats of the era. Uh, Vishweshwaraya, for example, was not particularly uh, gung ho about the Banaras Hindu University or the Aligarh Muslim University. He believed that universities that were catering to a particular religious domination could not, beyond a point, attain, uh, attain much success. Of course, set it into providing words. But Martin, on the other hand, he promoted Banaras Hindu University. At the same time, he was also uh, keen on Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, this is before his politics got a little more parochial towards the, uh, to the later stages. But he do believe that there had to be these universities that uh, attended to religious domination because you had to teach faith along with, uh, you know, uh, the, the program of economic modernization. So, Banaras Hindu University at that point of time, if you go through their uh, cinema and curriculum, they not only taught uh, uh, Hinduism, but they also taught a range of uh, world religions. But at the heart of it was this idea that uh, you had to temper the consequences of disruption through technology, through faith. Because he looked at Meiji Japan, he looked at Italy, which had by that time descended into fashion. He thought that technological disruption had broken pretty much every social bond that existed in these communities and they had nothing by way of faith because Meiji Japan was going through a great social and intellectual upheaval at that time. And so, Mahatma wanted Hinduism, for example, to be that sort of bond that would connect communities in India and somehow manage disruption caused by technology. And I believe the closest uh, anybody has come to creating that sort of a narrative and trying to follow it is Modi. Of course, the shriller parochial nationalism that Modi and his party has unleashed will become problematic to the same. Because I think the, the book's uh, thesis is that it is bookended by Nehru and Modi and in many respects, I argue, Modi is coming to the same conclusions as Nehru, which is that technology, of course, he, is, he has and continues to uncritically uh, embrace technology, but he is far more aware today of the disruptions socially, communally, ethnically that can be caused by technology than ever before. And I believe that he may now think of the, the incident that I use is the conversation that he had which is, you know, which went viral on YouTube, the conversation that he had with the mother of a school growing child who complained to the Prime Minister that her son spends too much time playing a video game. And the comment that went viral from Modi was, ye PUBG wala hai ke. But what he said after is really sort of uh, indicated, and this was in January 2019 before he was about to fight a election. He said, technology samadhan bhi hai or samasya bhi hai or samadhan bhi hai. The problem and the solution. And he went on to make a very nuanced statement that is unexpected from a 2014 or even before uh, vintage, uh, Modi of our previous vintage, which is a certain kind of skepticism towards the consequences of technology that has essentially been of his own. Uh, you, you want to come in and so, you know, I was actually born in Banaras and, uh, you know, I've seen uh, uh, this phenomenal university, Banaras Hindu University, and if it wasn't for this big belief and, uh, you know, his, his conviction about faith, Madan Mohan Mahalia would not have been able to raise this vast amount of 
resources and funds from the Maharajas of India to establish a phenomenal university. And uh, this is the only university which earlier on, right from the beginning, had a technological center, had a, had a great uh, center for uh, medical sciences and so on. And just about every advanced uh, scientific stream it had. Uh, so uh, he truly laid the foundations. But I, I, you know, I've also worked with uh, with the present prime minister. You know, in many areas I worked on, and I'm starting with uh, ease of doing business. Uh, you know, when I was secretary D I P P, and there, uh, if it wasn't for his push towards digitization and his push that every human intervention must be digital, and uh, you know that departments must speak to each other digitally, they must speak to each. Uh, you humans uh, asking queries digitally, it would have been possible for India to jump up 79 positions in the World Bank teams of doing this business. And then he made us do a competition among states in the spirit of competitive federalism to rank states. And the first time we did this, Gujarat came number one, but the very next year, Andhra beat Gujarat. And the third year, Telangana beat both Andhra and Gujarat. And this was all because of digital advancement. But the good thing was that. You know, states like Jharkhand and Chhattisgarh, which were at 24th and 25th position, they jumped up to massive reforms and came forth and forth. So, you know, I have found actually uh, Prime Minister Modi essentially a techie at heart. You know, totally a techie at heart. And his understanding of technology is far more sophisticated. And I, you know, it's quite amazing to listen to him at times. I find his understanding of technology and what digital technology can do to leapfrog in many areas far more sophisticated than many of us or even many of the scientific community working in that area. And he's really pushed this, uh, pushed us to that limit of using technology to improve governance and provide ease of living to the citizens of India. Shashi, I want you to come in uh, on this and I want you also to um, address this whole issue of digitization that uh, Amitabh Khan has talked about. I mean, in in the current context, as we see, um, you know, communications technologies also uh, literally taking over our lives. Um, digitization is a scary thing sometimes as well. What what are we putting out there? What information of ours is floating around in the ether somewhere in cyberspace? Um, the, the point that uh, Arun made about the linkages between faith and technology and how we're seeing that play out in different ways, manifest in different ways uh, in the current political climate we're in um, and also the harnessing of this technology for all kinds of things that may not always be good. Right, well let me, let me start off by reacting to a couple of the comments that uh, Arun and uh, Dr. Hira have made and then come back to Amitabh and you. I mean essentially uh, uh, Arun's uh, reference to Shwesha is actually very important but I think you, you seem again in the book to overstate the extent to which he and Nehru were on opposite sides. So don't forget that he did get the Bharat Ratna during the Nehru regime. And to this day, India marks Vishweshwara's birthday as Engineer's Day. So it's not exactly that, uh, that, that, that there was uh, a victory or a defeat. These were two different approaches. Uh, but they both were complementary and both were valuable and respected. As for Malvia's uh, infusion of a technological approach into religion, that was actually not that exceptional. When you think about it, a lot of people in the scientific community in India today, right till today, are rather devout. The great genius mathematician Ramanujan once famously said that an equation has no meaning for me unless it expresses the thought of God. So this, this question of, I mean, you know, yes, there was this Nehruvian binary, I suppose, that... Uh, the temples of modern India, the damned, you don't, don't need to go to the temples anymore. But, you know, I, I've written a, a piece some years ago about taking my mother to Putta Parthika, she's a Sai Baba devotee, and, and, and chatting to somebody in the line for the Vibhuti at the end. And the chap was a software program on Infosys. So, you can certainly have mantras and, and, and modern uh, uh, software coexisting in the minds of many people. But still, I, I would draw the line when, uh, when uh, Amitabh and Arun Wax eloquent about Mr. Modi's interest in technology. Uh, you just said you want to book him the book with Nehru. Uh, speaking of that in the same breath kind of quails the moment to hear Mr. Modi saying in a famous speech that the uh, head of our Lord Ganesh is proof of plastic surgery in ancient 
India. Uh, I mean, just two seconds to pause, you don't need much technology, uh, technological advanced thinking to realize that the smallest imaginable elephant head will not fit on the largest imaginable human neck. Uh, and that to take such a story literally actually discredits the very real accomplishments of ancient India in plastic surgery, where India did actually innovate the world's first plastic surgery operation, and we had we had uh, Shushita performing a rhinoplasty 2,000 years ago, for which the actual record of the surgery and some of the instruments have survived and been found by a cop. But when you start talking about Ganesh's head, then I think any pretensions to a scientific temper or technological thinking go out of the window. Uh, but I, I do also want to come back, Aaron, to your insistence on the private sector, because the fact is that there are some things the private sector will not do. I mentioned the solar cookers and stuff. There's no money in it. Why would the private sector even waste money doing R&D for a 50 rupee solar cooker? Who's going to buy it? Who's going to afford it? Is it going to be worth the expense? It won't bother. So that's why you need government. There's some things that only government can do. I mean, Dr. Vijay Raghavan mentioned, for example, we missed various buses, including the semiconductor bus. I'm not sure we have missed the semiconductor bus yet. There is, before the government today, a, a very ambitious semiconductor project. Uh, I got a presentation uh, about it from the Ananta Aspen Center. Uh, uh, Mr. Singer was working on it. But he says basically it's a three billion dollar project. You want India to become a world lead in semiconductors? It's possible but you need three billion dollars. By his own estimates, the Indian private sector will not be able to raise more than 500 million. He says loans you can get another 500 million. But for the project to be viable, the Indian government will have to stump up two billion dollars. And right now, as you know, the Indian government doesn't have the two billion dollars to spare. But the fact is, these are policy choices. You want to be a world leader in semiconductors? Think of it as a kind of infrastructural development? Then you need that kind of money. If you don't want to have that kind of money, then be reconciled to importing your semiconductor components from the rest of the world. But in that case, don't pretend that you're a technological leader anymore. So there are policy choices the government has to make. And it's far from clear that beyond the slogans that Amitabh has dutifully repeated that the government has actually made its choices. Uh, it's inevitable that we will have a certain amount of skepticism about things like the ways in which uh, technology can drive our society. There are some ways in which technology will actually be impossible for our society to, to accept. I, mean, I agree with Minister Gadkari when he said that he would oppose driverless cars in India. I would too as an opposition MP because there are 25 million Indians uh, who have no other profession but driving but it's cars or taxis or lorries or whatever, and that's more job than we certainly have to find for them. So, forget about the fact that in any case, driverless cars on Indian roads uh, bothers the mind, but the truth is that there's a simple employment logic behind the policy choice there. But there will be other technological disruptions coming. Uh, I think there was an Oxford Martin School study that said that 30%, uh, I think, of the jobs that will exist in the world in 2030 are jobs that don't exist today. For India, the figure was somewhat less. I think they said 9% or something. But if there 9% of the jobs available to the young people in this room who are going to be looking for jobs or working in jobs in 2030, or as jobs that they're starting now, they become obsolete by 2030, those jobs haven't been thought of yet. We can and should hope, as Amitabh does, that Indians will think of those jobs. And you will come up in this country with innovations that will lead to these new jobs. But Policy choices will have to be made at every stage. What are you going to fund? What are you going to leave to the private sector? What are you going to snap tariffs on that will make it difficult for people to do things? What are you going to actually encourage the import of, even if it drives some Indian industries underground, in order to stimulate further innovation? There are policy choices up and down the, 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 the ladder that the Prime Minister would have to consider, uh, whether it's this Prime Minister or a future Prime Minister, uh, the fact is that these are choices that govern the, the governments of today and tomorrow will have to make. They will really determine what possibilities are available to young Indians uh, in the remaining decades of the first half of the century. So it's an enormous challenge. I wish I could have uncritically embraced Amitabh's enthusiasm. As you rightly said, Maya, some skepticism is unavoidable. I live in Bhutan's Delhi in this area of privilege uh, given to Sarkari Bangalas. And I have not known a single day, not one day in the last 10 years, that we haven't had at least two power cuts, and sometimes as many as five. It may be a two minute power cut or a half an hour power cut, but they cannot, we have not mastered the technology of just distributing power efficiently.
to every house in Delhi. How on earth are we going to talk in terms of some of the grander ambitions without getting some of our basics right? Right. Uh, before I open up the questions, I'll just final uh, comments from you and this has uh, got to do with uh, this whole concept of the concerns and the fears around technology as well. And these concerns are not new. For example, in 1972, the Indian government, the Ministry of Labor of the Indian government constituted a committee on autom automation uh, headed by uh, V.M. Dandekar. The committee which included industrialists and had this, you know, uh, supposed public-private collaboration came to the conclusion that computers were not uh, resulting in any serious job losses. But yet the committee was forced to take the view that a computer should not be in introduced into public sector units because it was playing into a politics of a different kind. So the purpose of the book in many respects is only to acknowledge and highlight the role that politics plays. Uh, and you know, for instance, the industrialists who were part of that report attached dissenting notes to the final document saying, you know, if you have come to the conclusion that computers don't result in job losses, then why are we saying that they should not be introduced in PSUs? Uh, I agree with Dr. Zero, for example, the state has to uh, invest in certain sunrise sectors because there are no incentives, market-based incentives for the private sector. Let me give you an example of the semiconductor laboratory that was introduced in Mohali. The reason why it was introduced in Mohali and not in Madras, Madras was the other option, was because Zain Singh, who was the chief minister of Punjab, put a lot of pressure on Indira Gandhi to force the location of the SCL, the semiconductor lab, which unfortunately burned down, whatever reason. Uh, uh, in, in Mohali, as opposed to Madras, which had water and which would have soon the greatest concentration of computer scientists and developers anywhere in the world in, in, uh, in the course of the uh, you know the next two decades. So there is an element of politics and decisions around technology, and the state has always overplayed its hand. Is my thesis, of course, willing to, uh, you know to debate it, but the, the book's objective is to bring out uh, that stand of politics.